I want to welcome you to the Tom to the Dallas Independent School District STEM Environmental Education Center virtual field trip. We want to say a special welcome to Tom C. Gooch, David Burnett, Siegelville, Arthur Kramer, Lakewood, Marcellus Team, and Martin Weiss. Thank you so much for joining us on this beautiful winter morning. Uh, if you're watching, you have not signed up, please do so. Go to www.tiny.cc-3 uh, or slash 3 dash 5 registration. Sign up for it, please, so we'll have a record of your attendance. Uh, program this morning, structures and behaviors of organisms. During this virtual field trip, students will compare the structures and functions of different species, help them live and survive in a specific environment. Students will also differentiate between the inherited traits of plants and animals and learn behaviors. Ms. Tram will talk to you about structures and functions of an octopus. Uh, Ms. Silly, structures and functions of birds, inherited traits by Mr. Dominguez, and Ms. Ramirez will cover learned behaviors. Students, you cannot ask us a verbal question during this program, but you can go to www.tiny.cc slash question space answer, send in your written uh, question, and we'll do our best to answer them for you. I'm going to stop sharing my screen, and Ms. Ram is going to tell you about the structures and functions of an octopus. Hey, friends. So I am going to be talking to you all about the octopus. And let's get this little screen going. Da -da -da. All right, here we go. So at the end of my part of the field trip, you will be able to compare the structures and functions of different species that help them live and survive in a specific environment. So our essential questions are, what are some special features of the octopus? What is the largest octopus? So first let's talk about some of their structures. So this is octoanatomy. And of course we know that octo means eight and that is because octopus have eight arms. So each of their arms can move independently and they have hundreds of suckers on them. And those suckers allow them to hold on to things and also feel and taste. So it's kind of like if you had taste buds on your fingertips, but you had hundreds and hundreds of them all over your arms. Um, they also have a beak, which is kind of interesting. So underneath um, the octopus is their mouth and they actually have a beak like a bird. So they use that to bite their prey. Um, they actually have like a lot of different features of different types of animals. So they have a uh, beak like a bird. They've got multiple arms. They also breathe using gills, but they are in fact invertebrates. So they do not have bones, but they have a lot of interesting features um, that allow them to survive in the ocean. So usually they live in coral reef environments. So all of those arms and helping them um, be really agile help um, navigating those rocky terrains. Um, and they also have skin that can change color and um, change its texture so that they can blend in with all those different environments. They also have two hearts that pump blood um, through an octopus, the octopus's gills and a third heart that pumps blood to the rest of the body. Um, and they are extremely, extremely intelligent creatures. So let's learn about some different species. So we have um, different types of octopus. I'm only gonna talk about five today, um, but there are tons of interesting uh, different species of octopus that I would recommend researching on your own if you're interested. So there's a giant Pacific octopus and the giant Pacific octopus is of course native to the Pacific Ocean. Um, they can be 30 feet long and up to three or sorry, 600 pounds. So those are the largest. Um, they are absolutely huge and they're awesome to watch. Um, different aquariums have them. I'm not sure if the Dallas World Aquarium has one, but I have seen one at the Georgia Aquarium in Atlanta and they're really, really beautiful. Um, they can be found in nature on the Pacific coast from Alaska all the way to Southern California. Then, We've got the mimic octopus. And this octopus is native to Indonesia. It can be up to 60 centimeters wide. 
And it gets its name, of course, from its ability to mimic or copy or imitate other um, sea creatures. So on the next page, we've got um, the mimic octopus on the left imitating different creatures on the right. So we've got this flat fish over here. And what it does is it lays under the sand and its little eyeballs stick out so it can pop up and get its prey. And the mimic octopus can change its shape and texture so it kind of appears to be that um, same fish. Then it can also imitate the lionfish. And I think most impressively, it can uh, impersonate sea snakes or eels. So that one, it really, really looks like it, I think. My favorite is the blue ringed octopus. They are about six centimeters wide. They are native to the Pacific Ocean and they are extremely venomous. So uh, remember we talked about that little beak? Well, if an octopus bites you with his beak, a lot of times they are venomous and that's what they use to um, bite their prey. So most octopus actually are venomous, but this is the um, kind of most dangerous. It has venom that is 1000 times more powerful than cyanide. And even though it's only six even though it's only six centimeters, uh, it has enough venom to kill 26 human in just a few minutes. Um, so they are really, really powerful. And those bright blue neon uh, spots or rings are their warning colors. So a lot of animals in nature have really bright colors and those are a warning that the animal is feeling threatened and might attack. So even though these are um, very venomous, there has been like less than 10 people that have been ever recorded um, across the world being killed by these animals. So it's very, very rare. All right, then we have the flapjack octopus. I think these are so super cute. They kind of look to me like a Pokemon character or something you would make up. Uh, they remind me of those little plushies that everyone has with the smiley face and the sad face. Um, but the flapjack octopus are pretty small. They're 20 centimeters wide. They're native to the Pacific Ocean again. And they have these little fins that look like ears. So those are not ears. Um, they are fins that help them move. So you can see this um, structure of this octopus, the flapjack, they don't have as long of arms and their arms are webbed. So um, the reason they get their name is because they flatten out like a pancake or a flapjack and they flatten out and then they pounce on their prey. So that is um, how they kind of adapt. And so since their body shape is a little different, they use those fins to help them get around. All right, and our last octopus we're gonna talk about is the blanket octopus. This one is really interesting. So it has those um, blanket-like structures um, webbing between its arms. And the, that is actually used as a defense mechanism. So they don't use it for warmth or anything like we would use a blanket for, um, but they spread out their blanketed arms um, to appear larger and kind of intimidate potential predators. So something I find very interesting about these, they're really rare. And that's partially because of the discrepancy between the two genders. So the female octopus, which we see here, um, can get up to six feet long, while the male octopus only gets to like less than an inch. So like 0.9 inches, a couple centimeters um, long. So there's a huge discrepancy between the female and the male blanket octopus, which I think is really interesting. So that's all I have for structures and functions of octopus. I can't wait to see you next time. You're, you're muted. Okay, a question came in. If uh, an octopus loses a leg or an arm or a tentacle, what uh, will it grow back? And the answer is yes, it will grow back. Now it's not like the starfish where that leg would grow a new octopus, which the starfish will do. The octopus will grow a new leg. Yes, that is the answer. And now Ms. Silling is gonna tell us about birds.
everybody, I'm Celeste, and that's Adam behind the camera. We're at Gulf Coast Bird Observatory in Lake Jackson, Texas, and we're going to talk to you guys about birds today and how the structures on their bodies help them to survive out in the wild. So first of all, I wanted to talk about feathers. Um, all birds have feathers, even though some birds, like penguins, can't fly, um, but they all have feathers. And birds are the only animals with feathers, so these are really special structures. Um, there are different kinds of feathers. So, for example, this is a downy feather. Um, you can see it's really fluffy. It's moving with the wind, so it's not very stiff. Um, and there are actually coats made out of down. Um, there, I think there's down in this coat that I'm wearing right now because down actually keeps you warm. So down feathers are close to the bird's skin and they hold warm air close to the skin to keep the bird warm. Um, another type of feather is a flight feather. So this is a bird's wing. Um, you can see all these long feathers here. Those are flight feathers, and they're stiff enough that they can uh, move the air as the bird kind of moves its wings, um, but they're light enough that they aren't going to add extra weight to the bird. And then over here, we have a third type. Uh, this is more of a decorative feather. It's not going to help the bird fly or anything, but it's got some pretty colors, a pretty, sh pretty shape. And um, if you were a female peacock, you might be attracted to the male who has this feather. So different feathers serve different purposes for the bird. Downy feathers are also kind of sticky. They stick to you. <laughs> so this is a big feather that I'm going to show you um, to talk about the different parts of a feather. So this main line here all the way down here is called the shaft. It's also called the quill sometimes. And hopefully you can see that there's a little hole at the bottom there. And uh, when the feather is actually in the bird's skin, that hole is filled with blood because this is a part of the bird's body. It's not like hair where it's like dead material. It's actually part of the bird's body. Um, and uh, you'll notice that it doesn't have blood in it anymore. And that's because this feather was kind of shed off naturally in a process called molting. Because um, you and I, if we wore our clothes for like a year, they would get dirty, they would get messy, they would get torn. And the same thing happens to feathers. You can think of feathers kind of like a bird's clothes and they get kind of messed up after a while. So the bird sheds the feathers, it molts them and then grows back new ones. So. That's the, the quill. And then up here we have some little fluffies. Those are the down that I was talking about earlier. And then up here we have kind of a stiffer area. This is the vein of the feather. Um, and hopefully you'll be able to see that in the vein of the feather, it all moves like one material, but it's actually made up of little tiny hairs that I can pull apart. And on each of these hairs, it's probably too tiny for you to see on the video, but on each of these hairs, there are even smaller hairs. And then off of those are even smaller hairs. So we have the barbs, which are the long ones, the barbules, which are coming off of those, and the barbicels, cells, which are teeny, teeny, tiny. And the barb cells are able to hook together so that's why this moves as one material is because it's all hooked together. But if you can see kind of up close here, I can pull the hooks apart. But then if I was a bird and I had my feather messed up like this, I'd be able to preen it. I'd be able to move it back together and smooth it out. So if you ever see a bird with its beak kind of moving over its feathers, that's what it's doing, it's preening cleaning them off and kind of reorganizing its feather so that it's one vein. And that'll help it fly. It'll help keep the bird um, warm. It'll help keep the water off the bird's skin. So feathers serve a lot of purposes. And then um, one of the coolest things that they accomplish is to help the bird fly, like we talked about earlier. 
and Adam is going to show you guys how birds fly. All right, so as Celeste mentioned, birds have the ability to fly, and they do so with the wing. The wing has a lot of components to it to help it fly. As she said before, these feathers right here are known as the primary feathers, and these are what help the bird generate thrust. These feathers over here are the secondary feathers, which help generate lift for the bird. Uh, even the wing shape itself has its own special name called camber. It's kind of that teardrop shape of a little well, teardrop shape, I guess you could say. And if you actually look at airplanes too, they also have that same design for them that kind of help them generate lift. So when a bird is flapping its wings like this, you know, the primaries here are help it get up, well, move forward, and then secondaries are what help it uh, get up off the air. But when it comes to a bird too, there's actually two important muscles that a bird uses. If you all wanna stand up and do this too, hold your arms out like this, move it down and say pectoralis major. So pectoralis major, and when you come up, say supracoracoideus. I know, big word, <laughs> but fun word. So pectoralis major, supracoracoideus. And these are the two muscles that on the, attach on the wing itself and then onto the breastbone. And these are the two important muscles that help birds generate lift. And again, with feathers too, they have a really, cool, birds have a really cool feature of when they're flying along that the feathers themselves will also help reduce friction, but then also add friction when they wanna come down and land. So the, the feathers serve two purposes in that sense, which is good for them. Uh, that's why if you ever notice birds sometimes though, that they are you know flying in the wind, but they're not really going anywhere. They're not really being thrown backwards because the feathers are helping reduce that drag for them, that friction. So flying is a really important adaptation for a bird and they use flying for many mechanisms. They, it helps them survive by avoiding predators or even hunting prey, uh, keeping warm. So flying is a really important uh, feature for a bird because you know, they can also migrate with it. They can you know, hunt prey, like I said, they can avoid prey, they can, um, you know, even use their feathers and flight as a display option to try and attract a mate. So another important adaptation that birds have are uh, kind of impressive feet. And you and I have feet, but they're made for walking. Birds' feet are made for walking and a bunch of other things. So this, for example, is a bird's foot. Um, maybe you guys want to try to guess what kind of bird's foot it's a bird of prey. Maybe you could guess that from the huge talons that it has. This is a red-tailed hawkfoot. Um, you can see, obviously, like I said, the talons. Those are used for catching prey. So things like mice, snakes, lizards, uh, even other birds sometimes. Um, and these are also used for perching. So a, this bird would have been able to hug onto a branch and keep still even in the wind up high. It has one toe that goes backwards and three that go forwards, so kind of like this. Um, that helps the bird balance as it's walking. It can put weight back here. It can put weight up here. It can also clutch a branch or clutch a snake or a mouse or whatever it's catching. Um, the skin on it is kind of rough, so that stops the prey from escaping, and it's got these feathers uh, to keep it warm. The next foot is a pelican foot, and it's kind of shriveled, um, so it's hard to tell, but there's webbing between the toes. So there's actually like skin in between here. Um, and maybe you guys have already guessed what that's for. Uh, it's for swimming. If you have uh, experience swimming with flippers, this is like that. It helps you paddle faster. So that's one application of a pelican. And then we have a big foot. Uh, this is a heron's foot. I believe it's a great blue heron. Um, and the main ad adaptation here is long toes and a long foot, uh, or a long leg, sorry. The long leg helps the bird uh, keep itself out of the water. It doesn't necessarily want to swim. It wants to walk through the water. So it wants to keep its body dry and it uses the long leg for that. And the long toes kind of help disperse its weight so it doesn't sink down into the mud. If it was kind of standing like this, it might just shoop, go into the mud. 
but since it's all spaced out, it kind of helps it, you know? So those are some feet adaptations. The next kind of cool thing that birds have uh, that help them adapt to their environment and to life is their bill. So this, maybe you guys want to try to guess whose skull this is. It's another raptor or another bird of prey. Um, it's actually an owl skull. And you can kind of tell that the eyes are huge, the beak is hooked. And this hooked beak helps it um, kind of tear apart prey, uh, helps it eat the meat that it wants to get at. And then over here, we have another one. Sorry, it's like this. This is a spoon bill. Um, and this bill kind of helps the bird scoop up like a spoon its prey. So it's looking for like little fish, little bugs in the mud, um, and these will scoop up the prey and swallow it. And then this little guy is the smallest skull that I have. It's a ruby-throated hummingbird skull. It's very tiny. And it has a cool adaptation where the bill is very long and thin. So it can go inside a flower, a little tiny flower, and drink the nectar with its long bill. So uh, as you can see, different birds have different bills that help them eat different kinds of food and survive in different kinds of environments. And uh, for example, if a spoonbill tried to drink nectar, that wouldn't work so well. And if a hummingbird tried to eat a fish or a mouse, that wouldn't work so well. So I have a little demonstration here to show you guys. This is supposed to be the bill of maybe a bird with a really long bill. I'm blinking. Uh, a snipe, something like that with a really long pointy bill. And he can pick up little tiny bugs. If I was better with chopsticks, this would be a better demonstration. But he can pick up little tiny bugs, but he can't really crack a nut, can't pick it up so well, and he can't swallow it in his bill. But something like a cardinal, with a big thick beak, won't be able to pick up a little bug as well. Maybe he can catch it sometimes, but not as well as the snipe. But he can crack a nut and get to the, the yummy stuff inside. So different bills serve different purposes. And I hope you guys learned a lot about how different animals have different structures that can help them survive and thrive in their environment and eat different foods and escape predators and do all the things that animals do. All right, have a good day. Thank you, Miss Silling. Uh, we did have a question. What bird has the longest beak? An Australian pelican has a beak that can be up to 18 and one half inches long. And now, Mr. Dominguez is going to talk to us about inherited traits. Hey guys, it's Mr. Dominguez. In this portion of your virtual trip, we are going to talk about inherited traits. Inherited traits are things like eye color, fur color, height, ear shape. So things that are passed down from an organism's parent. We want to make sure that you understand that inherited traits are not the same as learned behaviors. So what you guys are watching right now are some of the learned behaviors that Higgs can display. So his tricks. So he can sit, he can lay, so he can do things like speak, but those things are not inherited traits. Some of Higgs' inherited traits would be his double fur coat, his foxy ears, his black fur color, and his very small stature. So those things are inherited traits. And even though he has some really awesome learned behaviors, those things were not passed down from his parents. Those are things that he learned from me. He quickly learned that every time he showed a behavior that I liked, I would give him a treat. So let's get this presentation started. 
It's such a beautiful day here at the EEC. We finally got some warmer temperatures, so thank you, son. I thought it would be a good idea to show you guys some of the animals we have here at the center and see what inherited traits we can spot. So as I walk closer to the goat and pig pen, I already see some inherited traits on display. If we take a look at this goat's coat color, brown and white, that is an inherited trait that was passed down from its parents. So that's a good goat right there. If we look at Benji, so Benji's the goat that's coming up to us, his horns are curved back. That is something that was passed down from his parents. He even has a little beard. So let's go into the center and see what other inherited traits we can spot. This is Bun, she is a Holland Lop rabbit. Her floppy ears are an inherited trait. What other inherited traits can you see? These are baby silky chickens. They have feathers that are very soft and feel like silk, thus the name silky chicken, an inherited trait. These are bantam chickens, including some of the grown-up versions of the baby silky chickens you just saw. Bantam chickens are smaller than regular chickens, so that small stature, that small size, is an inherited trait. These are some of our barn kittens. Besides the gray coat that you guys see, what other inherited traits can you spot? What about the ear shape or the eye color? That eye color is very beautiful, right? An inherited trait. These little animals are some of my favorite. They are isopods. You guys may know them as roly polies and they come in all different shapes, sizes, and colors. These are some of my favorite because of the coloration that they display on their back, which of course is an inherited trait. Did you guys know that isopods or roly polies are actually not insects? They are crustaceans. They have gills and require a very moist environment to be able to breathe. This little nocturnal animal is a Chihuahua gecko and he's got some pretty awesome traits that help him survive in his environment. He is arboreal and lives very high in the trees to avoid predators. He's got these really big pads on his feet that help him climb. He also has a prehensile tail that help him hang on to branches. So all of those are examples of inherited traits. This is Teddy, our redfoot tortoise. Redfoot tortoises are native to South America. I'll give you guys a few seconds to tell me what inherited trait gives this tortoise its name. Did you guys guess? Well, besides its red markings, he's also got a shell that's very different from aquatic turtle shells. That is an inherited trait. He's also got these very thick claws that help him burrow. Those claws were, of course, inherited. All right, guys, the last animal I'm going to show you today is pretzel, the ball python. Ball pythons are native to Africa and can reach lengths of up to six feet, which, of course, is an inherited trait. Her color, which is a normal color for a ball python, is also an inherited trait. Something that's very interesting about ball pythons is that they come in a variety of colors that were intentionally bred by humans since they are so popular as pets. All right, guys, I hope you enjoyed this portion of your virtual trip. Enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you, Mr. Dominguez. Now we have a, uh, a question. Name a, a very unusual inherited trait. And the one that I always like to do was called the curl tongue. Stick your tongue out and see if you can curl the edges of it up. Uh, I can't, mine's just flat. About half the people cannot curl it. So once you figure out that, go up and show your teacher. Go up to your teacher, stick your tongue out at her or him and show them that you have a curl tongue, which is an inherited trait. Just make sure your teacher has a sense of humor on that. Okay, and now Mr. Maris is going to tell us all about learned behaviors. Hello.
My name is Ramirez, and in this segment, we're going to be learning about learned behaviors. Now, I do have an animal friend for you guys. You've probably met her before. This is Pepper. Remember, she's a blue silky chicken, and I'm going to bring her out so we can talk about a few of her behaviors. So this is Pepper. They get the name Blue Silky because she has a patch of blue skin around her ear. And if you guys were to pet her, she is super soft like silk. Now, Pepper here has a couple of behaviors. The first one we're going to talk about are her learned behaviors. Learned behaviors are those behaviors that an animal has to be taught or they learn through trial and error or through experience. So some of the things that she has learned, she knows her name. So when I call for her and say Pepper, she comes running toward me because she thinks that she's going to get a treat. She also pretty much knows when it's time to go home. So around three o'clock or so, uh, she'll already be inside her cage. She just walks in there on her own because she already knows the schedule. Now, other behaviors that she has are innate or instinctual behaviors. Those are behaviors that she just automatically knows how to do. She wasn't taught them, it's just something she knows how to do. So for example, chickens know how to scratch. So they have long claws. Oftentimes, if you come out here and you see our chickens, they're often scratching in the dirt. They're scratching looking for insects and seeds and other things to eat. Uh, so that scratching behavior is innate. They just know how to do it because they have to do it to look for food. Other things that are innate is um, her knowledge of how to preen or clean her feathers. Uh, so that is something she just knows how to do instinctually. So I'm going to go ahead and put uh, our friend Pepper down so she can go play. And we're going to go ahead and continue with our presentation. So let me share my screen with y'all. I have a couple of essential questions for y'all. So hopefully by the end of this presentation, you'll be able to answer these two questions. The first is, what is a learned behavior? And the second is, what are two examples of learned behaviors? So teachers feel free to pause on this slide to allow time for students to observe and discuss some of the behaviors that they see on this slide. Be thinking about if these behaviors are learned and which behaviors might be innate or instinctual. So I have some examples here. We have a cute little raccoon that is washing his hands. We have a bird um, in flight. We have a baby sea turtle that has hatched and is crawling straight to the sea. We have a video of babies crying and another video of a mother polar bear teaching her baby how to hunt. So think of those examples, which ones might be learned, which ones might be innate or extinctual, and which ones might be a combination of both. So I'm going to go ahead and move on. In our next slide, we're going to go over some quick vocabulary. So behaviors. Behaviors are anything that an organism does involving action in response to a stimulus. So it's how an organism behaves or what it does. Now we know that there are two types of behaviors. We have innate behaviors, which are instinct, and then we have learned behaviors, which the animal has to be taught how to do. So let's start with the innate or the instinctual ones. Again, these are the behaviors that animals seem to do that come naturally. They just know how to do it. So behaviors, animals know how to do without being taught. So for example, when you're born, you just know how to breathe. No one taught you how to breathe. It's just something you know how to do. Uh, other examples with animals might be things like migration and hibernation. That is just an instinct that they naturally know that they have to do. Other examples would be social behaviors. For example, we have bees in this video. These bees are performing a waggle dance. That is how they communicate. Uh, so that is something they know instinctually how to do because that's how they communicate. Other examples might be bees gathering nectar for food. They automatically just know that they have to eat. And then also birds building nests. So birds just instinctually know that they have to build a nest to put the eggs in. So again, innate behaviors is just instinct. The animal just knows how to do it. The other one is learned behaviors. And a learned behavior is a behavior that is taught. So either the animal learned it from a parent or the animal learned from trial and error or from experience. Examples might be hunting techniques. So you saw earlier in the other slide, the mother polar bear teaching the baby polar bear how to hunt better. Uh, we also have examples of building better nests. 
and also these learning better locations for flowers. Now notice I have an asterisk by these, and that is because sometimes innate behaviors are modified by learning behaviors. So what that means is, let's take the example with uh, birds building a nest. Birds instinctually know they have to build a nest for their eggs, but they can be taught how to build a better nest. So some birds might have a really good nest and some birds might have a, a really bad nest that's not really so good. Uh, so it can be that instinct to build a nest can be modified uh, through learned behaviors, for example, building a better nest or bees learning better locations for flowers. Uh, so those would be examples of where innate behaviors can be modified by learned behaviors. And then when we talk about learned behaviors with people, examples might be things like learning how to use a hula hoop or learning how to ride a bike. Um, I love dogs and so I like to watch a lot of the dog agility courses. And so here we have a dog that had to be taught how to run through the agility course. So again, learned behaviors are those behaviors that have to be taught. So I'm going to show you guys a video, but I think it shows better if I show it straight from uh, the media player. So I'm going to pull up my media player. It might take just a second to get that going. Um, but these are some animals at our environmental center, and we're going to discuss some of their instinct behaviors and some of their learned behaviors. So in this first little part, we have Jabez, our goat, and Midnight the sheep. Uh, an instinctual behavior for Jabez, you see him headbutting. So that is an instinct. We didn't teach him to headbutt. Trust me, I don't like when he headbutts, uh, but that is just something he knows how to do. Um, so it's instinctual. Now some learned behaviors, uh, he knows where the feed closet is. So if he's hungry and he's out running around, he will just go to the, the food closet and he'll just stay there expecting food. He has also learned that there is a pecan tree right next to his pen and the branches are super high. So he already ate all the branches, the leaves uh, from the branches that were low. And so now what's left are all the branches from way up high. Well, he has learned to jump on top of these hay bales to reach those higher branches. This next one is Mochi, my rabbit. Um, some instinctual things that she just knows how to do is grooming. So she just knows how to clean herself and how to clean her other bunny friends. Uh, so grooming is an instinctual behavior. She just knows how to do it. I obviously didn't teach her how to groom and, and clean. Uh, so that's instinctual. Now, something she's learned, she is potty trained, which is really great. Uh, so she has a litter box there and she has several litter boxes throughout my room. So you see she's using her litter box here to go to the bathroom. So that is something that she has learned how to do. And something that she also knows how to do, very similar to Pepper, when it's time to go home, usually around three o'clock, uh, she usually is able to put herself inside her cage. She kind of has an internal clock and knows it's about time to go home. Uh, so usually around three o'clock, she'll already be inside her cage. But those are learned behaviors that she has been taught how to do. This is our barn kitty, some instinctual behaviors for cats. They automatically just know how to hunt because they need to get that food. Also, male cats just automatically know that they have to mark for their territory. Now, something she has learned is that cat has actually learned that by meowing at us really loudly, she has learned that she's gonna get some food. She's also learned to associate that when we have a bowl, that that means she's gonna get some food. Uh, so she has learned some things. And then in this next little part, we have two of my dogs. Shake. They've learned commands, so they know several words. They know shake, lie down. lie down, and sit. They're also potty trained, so they know how to go outside through the doggy door to go potty. Those are things that I had to sit. teach them to do. Shake. Now, unfortunately, they do have lie some down. innate or instinctual lie behaviors down. that I don't like. For one, they have a very high prey drive. Um, so oftentimes, especially this brown one, Abby, she has brought me dead squirrels, dead moles, and she has brought them inside the house as a gift for me. Um, but she, I obviously did not teach them to go hunt and kill those poor little animals. That is just comes in naturally and instinctually to these guys. Uh, so they both do have a very high prey drive. 
Also barking is an instinct. I obviously didn't teach them how to bark. That is just something that they know how to do. Sit. Also scent marking, especially uh, with the boy dogs, they might Lie pee down. and urinate all over the place trying to mark their territory. So that is just something they know how to do instinctually. So we have Toby and Abby was the other one. And another example, this is an example of bad training. Uh, this is my parents' dog, Little, uh, little Bit. And she has learned that whenever she brings trash to my parents, that she will get a treat, uh, which is not a great way to train a dog. But whenever she finds trash, whether it's toilet paper, candy wrappers, straw wrappers, um, whatever she finds on the floor, uh, she will just pick it up or she will go find it and bring it to my parents expecting that treat. Um, so I don't think that's good training, but that's just my opinion. Uh, so there's that little dog. She actually found a ketchup packet from the trash can. And so if we don't give her a treat, then she'll end up running around the house looking for uh, something else to get. Uh, so those are some examples of learned behaviors versus innate behaviors. So I'm gonna go ahead and get out of this and put us back on our last slide presentation. So just a quick reflection question for y'all. Uh, give examples of three learned behaviors for yourself or for humans in general. So on this slide, I have some examples of animals using tools. So this would obviously be an example of learned behaviors for animals. We have a chimpanzee that is using a stick to try and grab insects out of that mound. We have a bird that's using a stick as a scratching tool. We have an elephant that has also learned how to use a stick to help it grab some food that was just out of reach. We have a cute little badger that has learned how to use tools such as this garden tool to help him escape his enclosure. And then we have a dog that has learned how to skateboard. So again, learned behaviors are just those behaviors that an animal has to be taught to do or they've just learned how to do it through experience and trial and error. Uh, so that's all I have for you guys today on behaviors. We're gonna give it back to Dr. Gorman to answer any questions. Thank you, Mr. Maris. The question is, uh, what is a learned behavior that humans use? And cooking comes to mind. Now, I thought I was a pretty good cook, but I had a can opener and a microwave. But these teachers around here tell me that that's not cooking, that's just eating food. So cooking apparently is a learned behavior. Thank you so much for joining us today. Hope you enjoy the rest of this beautiful day. And now I am going to share my screen. During this virtual field trip, students compare the structures and functions of different species and help them live and survive in a specific environment. Students also differentiate between inherited traits of plants and animals and learned behaviors. Ms. Ram told you about the structures and functions of an octopus. Structures and Functions of Birds by Ms. Silling. Mr. Dominguez talked about inherited traits. And Ms. Ramirez taught you about learned behaviors. Thank you, teachers, so much for joining us. If you would, go to www.tiny.cc slash three dash five feedback. Send us a short form. We would appreciate it. Thank you again. Have a great day. And more importantly, have a great life.